Hello. Welcome to our next topic in research methods in psychology. Today we're going to talk about between subjects designs in experiments. Uh, this is a relatively straightforward topic. This will be fairly quick and painless, I would think. We're going to talk about um, a basic introduction to between subjects designs, some types of between subjects designs, talk about some critical issues, over uh, view the costs and benefits of between subjects designs, and finish with some very important discussions of statistical assumptions in between subjects designs. <clears throat> Excuse me, in particular, the homogeneity of variance assumption. Let's kick it off with a quick introduction. So when we're talking about between subjects or between groups design, um, each level of an independent variable has a different group of subjects. So in this example we see here, this might be a, a study on uh, major depression and different treatments for major depression. In one case, we might have drug therapy. Uh, in another case, we might have psychotherapy. And then we might put the two together in a third group and call that drug therapy and psychotherapy. Technically, that might be a mixed kind of design because now we sort of have combined two of our independent variables. But essentially, type of therapy is our independent variable, so we're not going to be too nitpicky about it. Uh, in this case, we have three groups assigned to three different conditions. So type of therapy, I guess, would be our um, independent variable. Now, so this is a relatively simple version of this. Uh, as we start to get more complicated, and in our next lecture, we're going to talk about complex designs, we might refer to what I call a fully between subjects design versus a mixed design. And a fully between subjects design will have um, two independent variables in this kind of uh, complex design where we have length of psychotherapy and psychotherapy type as our two independent variables. And we have four different groups um, in this. Uh, and in fact, we might actually now have a third independent variable in here, but let's focus on just this two by two. Um, where we have two weeks versus two months and cognitive versus behavioral therapy. So now we have one group of people in the two weeks of cognitive therapy, another group of people in the um, two months of cognitive therapy, group of people in the two weeks of behavioral therapy. <laughs> Excuse me. <sighs> Spring allergies have sprung here, here in Colorado. Um, so then finally we have uh, separate groups in each of these, what we would call cells. So we will uh, take a look at these kind of complex designs in the next lecture. This gets us then to different types of between subjects designs. The first of these are um, the most straightforward, random assignments to groups, in which case we will randomly assign people to groups. We might also have a matched group design or natural groups design, which is um, related to quasi-independent variables, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. So let's start with random assignments to groups. The general rule of thumb for random assignment is each participant has an equal chance of being in any of our conditions or any group in our between groups design. We can um, accomplish this random assignment in a variety of ways. A uh, very common way to do this is one in which we come up with a predetermined order. Uh, that is prior to the experiment we have, let's say we're going to run 100 subjects in four different conditions. Um, we would assign them, you know, subjects one through 100, and then randomly uh, assign each of those subject numbers to a condition. It's very easy to do in Excel. You can create random numbers in a column, put your conditions in the second column, and sort by the random uh, variable and we have random assignment. Really straightforward. You can also do this with a computer. So for example, a lot of experimental programs like E prime allow you to um, set your conditions and have the computer randomly assign participants to subjects, oh, sorry, <laughs> participants to groups. And as a result, it's completely random. Each person is when they sit down with the computer, the computer decides um, which condition to put them in. Um, with a pre-selected number of participants per group. So uh, these are two simple ways to do random assignment uh, to get people into um, conditions. I mean, there are, are lots of different creative ways you could, you could do this. Um, if you are less computer savvy, you could just as easily put each condition, let's say you're gonna run 100 subjects, you put 
25 slips of paper with condition one, 25 slips of paper with condition two, et cetera, all into a hat and draw out conditions each time a participant comes in. There are lots of ways to accomplish a random assignment. In the days of computers, we kind of do it um, in the easiest way possible. This gets us to match group designs. And match groups um, are an important tool in a variety of ways. And in fact, often we'll talk about doing a matched group design and a natural groups design combined. Um, where we match our groups based on some measurement. And generally, this is some measurement that is specifically, specifically related to the study. So it might be blood pressure. So we're concerned about fitness or stress levels. So we're going to match based on blood pressure. It might also be verbal ability, which eliminates a possible confound, which is specifically also, again, related to the study. So oftentimes, if we're looking at cognitive differences in males and females, we will match based on verbal ability because that's a pre-existing known difference between males and females. So if we're interested in memory and memory alone, we want to control for verbal ability. So generally what we're trying to do is we're trying to control for something else. And so we might try to match our groups based on a physical fitness measure or a cognitive measure, education, etc. So match groups designs are, um, useful in a variety of instances. If you have a small number of participants, um, you can get more power out of a matched group design if uh, you have a good matching variable. Uh, you wanna make sure you have some sort of good matching task or matching variable. So again, fitness could be body mass index, could be um, body fat percentage, blood pressure, um, could be verbal ability, it could be IQ, could be SAT score, could be GPA. Any of those are things you might think about using. But you also want to have a reason to match them. That is a reason to suspect that this variable is important to your study and related to the outcome. And so you want to control for that. And that's what's really what you're doing with a match sample design. So finally, you can use a match samples t-test or a dependent samples t-test. They're the same thing. It just depends on what your stat package calls them. Um, it's a dependent samples t-test in this case because you have created a, a dependency because you have accounted for the covariance associated with whatever variable you are using in this particular matching design. Finally, we have natural groups designs. This is when we're gonna compare across populations. So we're interested in gender differences, in aging, uh, something like that. So we're gonna use gender, age, or other groups as a quasi-independent variable. And again, this is dependent on the kind of study you might be doing. So we often, slice up our participants into younger adults and older adults, or younger adults, older adults, and elderly, uh, males and females. We might also, in some studies, look at um, gay males, heterosexual males, heterosexual females, and lesbian females um, as for different groups. And in fact, I've seen that done in a variety of cognitive tasks, um, looking at biological underpinnings of sexual orientation. But the idea here is we're using some sort of existing um, group as our quasi-independent variable. It's not an independent variable because we're not manipulating any of these things. Uh, we can't make people older um, just because we wanna randomly assign them to conditions. So we use this as a quasi-independent variable. And in our statistics, it's treated as an independent variable. Now, often, if we're going to do a natural groups design, we might wanna match them. So if we have older adults and younger adults, we might want to try to match them based on education, their IQ, or working memory ability. Um, depending on what we're interested in studying, we might try to match them. And so these are a couple of ways in which we can look at uh, group, existing group differences. So some issues we have with between subjects design, one of the most important of these is to try to have as balanced a design as possible. You want to have as close to an equal number, number of subjects in each group as possible. And this has to do with the equality of variance or homogeneity of variance assumption. Basically, um, parametric statistics have an underlying assumption that the variance is going to be the same across your two groups. And so if you have a whole bunch more subjects in one group than another, uh, you are going to run into some difficulties. Of course, in any between groups design, there's the potential for between group differences. So we wanna to try to make every effort possible to limit this confound through random assignment, of course, we also wanna make sure even though we're randomly assigning, we wanna collect as much data as we can to make sure that our groups are as similar as possible. So we wanna make sure we get age, um, gender. We might be interested in 
physical attributes, body mass index, height, weight, blood pressure, heart rate, verbal ability, who knows? But we wanna make sure that we can try to account for those differences that might occur because of random assignment. And that can occur <clears throat> even in the best studies. So a really well-designed study like the Women's Health Initiative can end up with an unbalanced design simply because of random effects. So you wanna watch out for that. <clears throat> Finally, we wanna make sure in these between subjects conditions uh, that everything is the same. The only differences are independent variables. In a within subjects design, this is easier because everyone's getting the same treatment. Um, in this case, we wanna make sure the only difference is an independent variable. I consulted on a, uh, I was on a project a number of years ago and the investigator was new to conducting research and um, they were looking at whether or not online versus in-person classes were the same and I asked if the only difference was online versus in class and it wasn't there were different instructors different textbooks I mean there were so many different things that there was no way to determine whether or not the difference was due to online versus in-person learning um, so you want to make sure that everything is standardized and the only thing that is different is that independent variable finally um, between subjects designs and between groups designs don't have as much statistical power so we're going to have to have bigger effect sizes, um, larger numbers of subjects in order to get uh, to detect differences. So it's just a little bit more difficult. We'll talk here in the next um, slide about some of the issues with between subjects designs. They're simply more costly because um, they cost us time and money. So that gets us to some pros and cons of between groups designs. So some benefits, we don't have any transfer or practice effects, so we don't have to um, worry so much about counterbalancing for order, that sort of thing. There are still counterbalancing issues in between subjects designs. Oftentimes these are materials. So for example, if we're doing a recognition memory task, we still have to counterbalance for old and new items, that sort of thing. We get limited fatigue effects because again, participants aren't participating across the entire experiment. They're only in their one condition. Uh, we get limited demand characteristics because our participants are only getting a peak at their condition, not the entire um, study, so that's important. Uh, some studies, of course, require between subjects design, particularly anything that might involve deception, excuse me, <clears throat> um, and anything that um, is clearly sort of a one-off. Uh, so, for example, you can get people to quit smoking kind of once. You might get a crack at them again, but it means you weren't successful the first time. Um, again, depression treatments. Uh, oftentimes uh, these do require between subjects designs. So some problems with between subjects designs, are, of course, adding independent variables or levels to an independent variable um, is gonna require more subjects. Uh, so you have to think very carefully anytime you're gonna add a between subject design, particularly if um, it's a high cost experiment. So if you're doing, a, let's say a PET scan, which is about you know $4,000 a participant, adding 10 more participants is $40,000. And even in a lower cost experiment, so in one of my experiments, we pay participants $100, adding a between subjects variable doubled the cost of that experiment. So rather than $3,000 um, for 15 subjects, it, it ended up costing us $16,000, or sorry, $6,000 for 30 subjects. So I didn't do any of that math right, sorry, 1,500. <laughs> $1,500 for 15 participants, $3,000 for 30 participants. Um, I'm only on my first cup of coffee, so forgive me. Um, so then we have the problem of between group dif differences. We might have more males and females. I mean, you just have to really be very cautious in those kind of between group differences. Finally, we have some statistical considerations, which is our next stopover. So our primary concern in between subjects designs is the homogeneity of variance assumption underlying parametric, parametric statistics. So um, a general rule of thumb is no group should be larger than one and a half times as large as another group. So if you have 100 subjects in one group, you could get away with up to 150. That's probably pushing it, but you know that's the kind of general rule of thumb. Uh, the biggest thing is you have to test for this assumption. Um, and if your data violates the homogeneity of variance assumption, and most statistics packages will do this for you, then you wanna use non-parametric statistics. Um, so in between subjects designs, of course, we're doing um, an independent samples t-test or a between subjects uh, analysis of variance. We'll get into within and between subjects and mixed designs 
um, here in the next um, lecture. So just be cautious when you're doing between subjects design and make sure you're testing for that homogeneity of variance assumption underlying those parametric statistics because it's a really important part of having robust, um, well-established data. All right, thanks. And next up, we will talk about complex designs.